Hi, uh, this is Duncan Ferguson. In this unit we're going to discuss the regulation of the adrenal cortical secretion by the hypothalamic and pituitary um, and otherwise known as the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This will be very important for us to understand many of the clinical concepts um, regarding testing as, as well as some treatment. In this uh, figure, um, a very s simple cartoon is, is laid out to sort of demonstrate the, the, this axis, the HPA axis. And so uh, we have the, the hypothalamus, and it, it produces the peptide uh, corticotrophin releasing hormone, CRH, it has, which has a positive effect on the pituitary gland with regards to its uh, secretion of the peptide called ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone. And it's ACTH that has a positive effect uh, on the adrenal glands. And we'll talk about not only that's an effect for secretion, but also in synthesis and secretion, but also growth uh, leading to hypertrophy of the glands if, if chronic. So this mechanism is generally a positively regulated one. We also can have up, up above um, the effects of stress um, in general ways uh, can activate uh, functions of the hypothalamus. They get feed um, information fed from it that will also stimulate this pathway. Key to the re normal regulation of um, this axis, uh, with the goal being, the body's goal, if you will, of being having normal cortisol, normal glucocorticoid levels, is that this um, stimulation, and these glands, keep in mind, are um, at distance from each other. The hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary gland by a portal system, but indeed we call it an endocrine system nonetheless. Um, but clearly, ACTH being secreted by the pituitary has a long way to travel to find the adrenal glands. So how do the adrenal glands communicate back to these uh, other two organs uh, in terms of how much um, secretion uh, is needed? And that's basically a fairly standard, um, classical, if you will, negative feedback system. And the key here is that the negative feedback is both at the pituitary and the hypothalamus. And we actually, uh, as I've shown you on, uh, on the right, when you administer exogenous glucocorticoids to animals, and we do this for diagnostic testing, or we do it for clinical purposes for treatment, we have to realize that both the hypothalamus and the pituitary function will be suppressed, uh, and the adrenal glands could atrophy. Of course, their secretions go down very rapidly, but then chronically they can atrophy. And this is crucial for us to understand later on that when you have chronic administration of exogenous glucocorticoids and then remove them from the animal, they can't immediately respond with the appropriate amounts of even physiological amounts of glucocorticoids and certainly have a hard time uh, responding to a stressful circumstance. So let's talk about how this negative feedback occurs. Um, according to the free hormone hypothesis, it's the unbound uh, glucocorticoid, in this case we're gonna talk about cortisol, that exerts negative feedback. And it does so in the hypothalamus by reducing CRH secretion in two ways. Directly, by just directly inhibiting the CRH neurons in the hypothalamus, and indirectly through interaction with the hippocampal neurons which synapse on the hypothalamus. And hippocampus is um, part of the, um, the mechanism that normally is associated with memory, but in this case the glucocorticoid effect um, is impacting um, through direct, indirect inhibition. Um, in the interior, the other, the other place where the negative feedback occurs is on the interior pituitary uh, where you see reduced ACTH secretion. And this is an effect that where glucocorticoid receptors directly on the corticotrophs lead to an inhibition of the action, of that positive action of CRH, 
on ACTH secretion. So it's, it's sort of blocking uh, somewhat the uh, positive effect of CRH on the pituitary cell, um, the corticotrope uh, that makes the ACTH in the anterior pituitary. In this uh, relatively complex side, we're, and I'll talk you through it, um, what we have is a representation of the sort of the mother peptide of all um, the, of ACTH and some opiate uh, peptides. And I want to bring in this slide together your concept of how the body has developed mechanisms whereby it can um, not only uh, release uh, ACTH uh, to stimulate the stress response, a glucocorticoid response to stress, but it also can produce some peptides, metencephalin and beta endorphin, which we know are endogenous opiates. And so what, what's happening here is you have um, the single peptide, and then from that, various parts of the either the in, interior, I mean, intermediate lobe, IL, or the anterior lobe can make uh, further products by cleaving these peptides and the key thing is that we have the stimulation of both the ability to make glucocorticoids that leads to volume retention in a, in a stress or so let's say a shock or a trauma and at the same time the endogenous pain relief uh, that's necessary to help the organism, so the animal survive in beta endorphins and the enkephalin, metenkephalin. And so you can see that uh, these protective mechanisms have kind of been built into uh, the, the uh, system by release, being released from one large peptide and then being cleaved in various ways, depending on what the cell, the, the uh, parts of the um, lobe of the pituitary uh, is processing them. So, so the um, ACTH, uh, we just said is a, a derivative of POMC. It has po it's positively regulated by the hypothalamus, and that's by corticotrophin releasing hormone, CRH. Uh, and CRH um, is a 41 amino acid peptide, which stimulates a uh, G protein coupled receptor, stimulates adenylate cyclase on the ACTH producing. Um, pituocyte, pituocyte, or in this case, a corticotroph of the pituitary um, gland. Um, it's neurotransmitter control of ACTH, and this is important from a clinical standpoint, is that there's chronic in, cr tonic inhibition, excuse me, uh, by dopamine, the neurotransmitter dopamine. And this is important because in conditions in the dog and in the horse where we have pituitary, what we call pituitary-dependent hyperadrenocorticism, which means there's dysregulation at the, somewhere between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. There is some evidence, particularly in the horse, but some in the dog, that, that uh, dopamine um, may be deficient in this situation. So by reducing dopamine, you get loss of that inhibition, and you can you then get an increase in ACTH. We also know that serotonin can stimulate uh, ACTH. So basically, ACTH itself binds to the adrenocortical cell, binds to a G-protein coupled receptor linked to adenylate cyclase, increases adenylate cyclase. And if we go back a couple of units, you'll remember that we have the side chain cleavage enzyme, also known as cholesterol desmolase, is being stimulated as the key step between cholesterol to pregnenolone, sort of the rate limiting step for, for glucocorticoid synthesis. And um, also ACTH is a stimulant of uh, adrenocortical cellular hypertrophy. And that's why when an animal has um, a condition where dysregulation of the pituitary and ACTH production is going on, that we can get sort of bilateral symmetrical um, enlargement of the, of the adrenal glands. So on this, this slide I wanted to mention the, the, the studies that have been done to understand the way that 
cortisol and ACTH are secreted. Um, and I'll mention the studies in the dogs, but the graph that you're seeing below is basically what it looks like. This is a human down here. And let's, let's say you're, depending on when you're um, actually studying this unit, you know, if you're studying it in the morning, you may have a, a fairly high cortisol as a human being up here. If you're in doing it late in the afternoon or into the evening, your cortisol would be much lower. But notice that around that uh, smooth curve, we have these fluctuations, peaks and troughs, that show that ACTH and cortisol are basically released in a pulsatile way. They're episodic. Um, what do we know in dog, dogs and cats? Well, we don't see this diurnal variation in a consistent way. Uh, diurnal means that it's elevated in one part of the day and it's lower in another. We don't see that in dogs or cats. Um, we do see the episodic secretion um, that you see in, uh, with ACTH and cortisol, but it's not episodic when it's been carefully studied. And one reason that um, understanding this, this pattern of secretion is, is important is that we want to, when we give glucocorticoids, we would like to know something about the normal rhythm so we can mimic them when possible. And there's been some discussion over the years about whether you should give glucocorticoids um, you know, at one time of the day or another based on this. In people, they would give you glucocorticoid replacement therapy in the morning because they see the peace in normal situation. But we don't see that um, in dogs and cats. I'd like to discuss the uh, stress response now. Uh, I believe it's crucial for us to understand why when we uh, alter the axis, the HPA axis in any way, we then become responsible as clinicians for managing the stress response. So it's useful to know when um, glucocorticoids are being called on uh, by an animal that's stressed. First thing I'll just mention that um, in people, stress can overcome those circadian rhythms that we talked about before, uh, meaning that that diurnal variation can go away. Um, in dogs, we know that chronic stress uh, and profound stress can increase cortisol. And an example of this is the, uh, an animal that's been put just under anesthesia or surgery can see an increase in cortisol for a week. And by the way, this dog over here is not stressed. He's not also under anesthesia, not stressed. Um, nor is this cat. Um, but they're sort of the anti-stress examples in this, this uh, particular slide. The cats, however, mild stress, as we know, can cause increases in cortisol. And this can be shown in a couple of ways. Uh, we can see uh, the elevation of glucose. Not uncommonly in animal it's stress that comes to our clinic and we can find a glucose that's risen up to 400 or more milligrams per deciliter, quite above you know, four, four to five times above a normal range. And this can be d due to the fact that, that not only cortisol, but also epinephrine are released, sort of antagonizing the insulin effects. In addition, uh, you can see a reduction of lymphocyte count, lymphopenia as part of the stress leukogram, because glucocorticoids, as we've described in this other units, will have a suppressive effect on the round cells, uh, such as lymph lymphocytes and eosinophils. In fact, in the old days um, of diagnosis of adrenal excess or insufficiency, you would look for a suppression of eosinophil count in the uh, animal with hyperadrenocorticism and an elevation of the eosinophil count in the um, animal with Addison's disease. So in summary, the regulation of the uh, synthesis of adrenal steroids by the HPA axis um, really uh, has several key features. We have the typical um, negative feedback that uh, both on the pituitary and the hypothalamus to reduce CRH and ACTH, that's key. 
And that's why when you have that occur, you can't just kind of replace one or the other to try to help the animal recover after, say, chronic administration of glucocorticoids. Um, we know that ACTH and, and um, endogenous opioids like the enkephalins and endorphins are products of pro-opial melanocortin in the pituitary, which connects stress and pain uh, response in the, uh, in the animal. And that ACTH secretion is tonically inhibited by dopamine, conditions where dopamine is reduced or believed to be reduced, we see elevation of ACTH. Um, there's episodic secretion of cortisol and ACTH, one following the other, a cortisol following the ACTH, but there's no apparent diurnal variation in domestic animals, dogs and cats at least, where they've been studied. And finally, um, the glucocorticoid concentrations are sometimes used as chronic uh, indicators of stress. Uh, not only in plasma glucocorticoids, but sometimes fecal uh, glucocorticoid conjugates are used in the wildlife or zoo example. But there are species differences with regards to what, is, what an animal might experience as acute stress.